You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey, David. Well, this this is our first episode. I I know. I'm I'm interested to see how it goes and how hopefully everybody likes it. <laughs> I I already like it, so I think <laughs> we're off to a good start. This uh, is uh, the Common Descent podcast. Thank you for listening. Um, my name is David, and my name is Will, and we are two uh, we we are paleontologists who are also science educators. And we love talk. Well, mostly we love talking. Yes. Uh, but we also love talking about cool, sciencey stuff. So this podcast is going to be all about us sharing our excitement for uh, the science that we like a lot. A little um, bit of this, a little bit of that. Yes. Uh, so this first episode, well, the way that we're going to structure this episode, let's jump right into it, is we'll start off by sharing some la- uh, some of the latest news in science that we're interested in, and then we figure we'll start every episode like that, and then do a, a topic for each episode. Yes. Where we'll talk about uh, uh, some sort of topic, some sort of subject that we've chosen, that we've done some background research on, and we'll have a, a discussion about that, because the fun part is really just us talking back and forth about cool stuff. Yeah. So this episode, especially because it's the first one, were you going to say something? No, I was just, just, you're good. Cool. Finger (laughs) pistols. Will and I are on Skype. Yes. So we've got visual cues between each other. None of you can see any of that uh, out there, out there listening. Uh, First episode, our topic is, well, we're, we're both paleontologists by trade. And Mm -hmm. and most of what we're going to talk about on this podcast is probably going to fall into the, the broad realm of paleontology. So for the first episode, our discussion topic is just going to be paleontology and what goes into it and why we do it and some of our own experiences. And this should be a, a cool way to, to sort of, uh, for you as the listener, to get to know us and also for us to go over some a lot of the sort of broad swath of topics that we might end up covering in various episodes of the podcast sort of lay down the black, the background yes so if if there's anything that comes up in this episode that you as a listener are interested in then listen to our podcast because we're going to be talking about that kind of stuff indeed yeah cool well let's go ahead and start off with news because will and i have been trolling through some news yeah you take the first one yeah yeah okay yeah. well then i'm going to start off with probably the coolest news uh this one really jumped up at me uh and this is the Hatsigopteryx paper yes that just like came that out one. so that yes it's cool. it's Darren Nash and Mark Witten who are two uh, prominent paleontologists and because Mark Witten is is on the paper you know that there's going to be really cool art and he had a whole blog post about this where he included some of his new artwork uh quick overview of this so Hatsigopteryx is a pterosaur uh pterosaurs are those big leathery winged uh flying reptiles from the age of dinosaurs, which are not actually dinosaurs themselves, despite what uh, the movies want you to think. No, they are not. Uh, Now, some pterosaurs came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some of them were tiny, but there are a handful that were ridiculously huge. Uh, Quetzalcoatlus is a famous one. Hatsigopteryx is another one that's just as big. This is a 35-foot wingspan, 10 meters across uh, animal. And a lot of study has gone into showing that particularly these big pterosaurs probably weren't, you know, flying around grabbing prey out of the sky, but they would land and stalk around on the ground and snatch up stuff Which like really storks cool. do. It's, it's super cool. Like that, that's really a, a just, uh, just imagery wise. That's a cool yes. thing for a, a big thing to land and then begin it's a flying giraffe that lands down and then begins to eat other animals yeah that's exactly what it looks like uh especially in mark's reconstructions well the previous giant pterosaurs that we've known about are these long slender necks long slender faces 
but Hatsigopteryx, in this new paper, they looked at uh, some new skeletal material and found that its neck and probably its skull were built big, powerful, and probably heavy. So it had a shorter neck that was beefier to support what was probably a very big skull. And this, and they, did, they even did some biomechanical work on it to show how powerful it was. And they're interpreting that whereas the other big pterosaurs were probably picking up relatively small things with their delicate heads and necks, this one would not quite have been as tall, but it would have been beefy and eating relatively big things like small dinosaurs. Which is, it's, it's just super cool <laughs> to imagine this thing stomping around. It's, it probably wouldn't stomp because it was still this, you know, it was beefy, but it's still a pterosaur. No, no, the, the bird analog is really, the, the paper used a couple of birds. Uh, and when you quoted it, when you first posted it, the, the shoebill stork was used. Yes. When I looked at the pictures, what immediately came to mind for me was the marabou stork. Mm-hmm. It just because they have those crazy scissor bills and they are just horrifying creature. <laughs> like yes. they're horror monsters in the guise of a bird. Uh, which is what I very much expect this guy to be. It's just these giant scissor bills coming down and grabbing whatever it wanted. Yes. And the cool thing, uh, the other, the cool ecological thing is that this is on an island and island evolution gets weird on islands, but which we'll probably this touch on some other time. <laughs> yeah. We'll do a whole episode about that. Um, this particular island, there are no fossils of big theropods. And in fact, Mark pointed out in his blog post that this is the only site where you are more likely to find a big pterosaur than a big theropod. And they've been working on this site for like 150 years. So there is a good chance that this thing was the apex predator <laughs> of this island. That's where there were no big dinosaurs. There were, uh, there were actually, this island was home to dwarf sauropods. Oh, I love those. I want to say Megurosaurus, which was a a 20-foot-long a sauropod, which is tiny. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so this it's, it, it's looking like this thing might have been a big, flying, ground-stalking apex predator. That's really... Uh, that's the best thing for me about islands is when you get weird top predators. When you yes. get an animal doing a job that it's really not supposed to in most places but here it sure is yeah it's super cool that's awesome yeah cool you want to take the next one all right so i'm gonna jump into uh i'll save that one for a second i'm gonna talk about petrified tree rings uh cool so this month there was a paper and it was uh the paper itself is by uh ludwig luthart and ronnie i don't know how to say his last name because it has russian letters uh, well, all right. R Robler, if that's I, how you say it. the one that looks like a bee that's squishy. <laughs> <laughs> In my Russian expertise, <laughs> which is exactly zero, <laughs> I, I think it's okay. They found a uh, piece of petrified wood. There's a forest that was uh, uh, covered in volcanic ash, and it's a 290 million year old pieces of fossilized wood, and they were able to go through the tree rings. Uh, and this paper is interesting, first off, just because it's cool old trees uh, with that are really well preserved. They have pictures of it, and it just looks like a piece of a trunk. Um, but the implications behind it are the, the things that were interesting to me. So they were able to go through the rings, and they were able to find uh, a pattern. And so for anyone who doesn't know tree rings vary in width depending on the, how good the year was for the plant. Thicker mm -hmm. rings for better years, so on and so forth. You can see dry spells. And they were able to find a cycle, you know, a rough cycle of these ring patterns that came out to uh, just about, I think it was 10.6 year cycle. Yeah, 10.62 years. Yeah. There was a cycle which matches the roughly 11-year cycle our sun goes through with sunspots. Cool. So the sun varies in intensity 
through the amount of sunspots and the intensity of the radiation it puts out and peaks about every 11 years. And we've huh. seen that with the, uh, I think it was 150 years or something like that, that humans have actively been monitoring mm-hmm. it. Uh, okay. And so we have that data that it's been consistent during that time. Uh, though I found some papers that were people thinking it was increasing. But if this is correlating to that, that means that the sun's been doing that 11-year cycle for almost 300 million years. Yeah. And uh, there's still debate on that because basically the thought is that the cycle of the sunspots changing intensity, uh, and this goes into a whole bunch of meteorology stuff that (laughs) is outside of our studies, but the way the radiation affects certain parts of the atmosphere, the stratosphere and the ozone it creates, which as it breaks down changes the temperature, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't actually uh, have a background in, but it can, there are studies that suggest it could affect weather, that basically... Uh, differing amounts of radiation could affect uh, uh, cloud formation, and so okay. you could get and that more... was affecting the plant. And then, uh, therefore, growth. more clouds are going to be more rain, which will affect clouds and which will affect the plants, and less clouds will be less rain, so on and so forth. That part's still evidently being debated among mm-hmm. uh, meteorologists and solar analysts, um, but there is definitely support for it and if that's true and if that these rings are correlating with that the sun's been really stable for a long time that's really interesting which is just cool to me because there's a whole bunch when you looked i I, when i was doing my side research dozens of articles came up on does the sun affect climate because of course being in the age that we are with the climate debate that goes on that's one of the questions of people going well couldn't couldn't it be the sun's getting hotter? Mm-hmm. And there have been things where people were thinking and suggesting that those solar cycles are intensifying, but it was only right, by point one percent, which would still be yeah. a lot. But uh, this is suggesting that no, not really. Yeah, it's interesting to know that if it's the case that solar activity has been so consistent. Yeah, it's it's cool to me. Uh, what really strikes me about this is the fact that we can look at plants from 290 million years ago and learn stuff about sun activity from their growth records, which is really cool. It actually reminded me of um, uh, a while back there was there were the cor- I, I, I don't know if, if you've heard about this, but there were corals from I think the Devonian or the Silurian where looking at the growth records in the coral, the daily and seasonal records, people were able to calculate how long a day was based on how many days were in a year. That's Because fantastic. the Earth's rotation has been slowing down. Mm-hmm. So days have been getting slowly longer. And they calculated that there were, it was like a 21-hour day based on growth records in the coral. Interesting. Which is so cool. Like, there's so much cool little data that, that's hidden away if you know how to look for it. On that, that was one thing that the article talked about was the fact that uh, until, you know, or without this, really the farthest back we can typically reach when looking at uh, detailed things on climate and solar cycle was like uh, current trees and ice cores and stuff like right. that, which is really only recent, you know. Yeah. Geologically speaking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so this was one of the first times where we could get a really detailed look at a good chunk of time back, which is pretty wow. cool. That is super cool. All right. Back to you. Cool. Um, before I do my next one, you mentioned the age of your fossils, and I forgot to do that. Um, Hatsigopteryx was very late Cretaceous, so not much older than 65, 66 million years. Uh, my second paper, my second bit of news, is about trilobites. Um, trilobites, uh, dear listener, even if you don't know what a trilobite is off the top of your head, you know what a trilobite is. These are, like, as far as invertebrates go, they've got to be the most popular fossils in the world. Or at least uh, they m- look like most well-known. Yeah. 
they're they're sort of pill bug esque, but they belong to their whole group of arthropods. And we know a ton about trilobites, but apparently, I learned, we don't know hardly anything about their reproduction. And this new study that just came out reports what could be the first ever trilobite eggs. Which is awesome. <laughs> it's so cool. And they're on the trilobite. So they were found, and it's on a couple of trilobites from upstate New York. These are Ordovician, so at, at the youngest, they're 440 million years old. These are crazy old. Um, but it's a bunch of eggs tucked under the head segment of the trilobite's body. And this is really cool because it implies uh, two things. One, because uh, they're, they're basically they're suspecting that it may have been releasing its eggs from the back of its head like horseshoe crabs do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is a big sign of external fertilization. Right, so so not all animals, you know, do the nasty, do the as deep. as it were. Uh, they release eggs and sperm into the water, especially in marine organis- uh, organisms, and then they fertilize outside the body. Uh, so trilobites may very well have been doing that. But the other thing that's cool about this is the fact that the eggs are attached to its head looks like it's brooding its eggs. It's carrying them around with it to care for them. Uh, which is something that a bunch of crustaceans and insects do today, and there's even a bunch of fossil evidence for for arthropods doing that uh, way, way back into the early Paleozoic, uh, as old as this trilobite and even older than this. Uh, but it's really cool, uh, not only because it's the first, you know, it's a, it's a big, cool clue into trilobite reproduction, but also because it's a clue into the earliest state of arthropods that external fertilization and brooding behavior were present all the way back to the start of this group of of animals uh, which tells us a lot about their early evolution um, which is it's it and the, the the pictures are really cool we'll put some up on the blog post uh or yeah. at very least we'll put these links up on the blog post so people can take a look at them no it's that any like, any time you can connect something like that with past ancestors is always really cool to me. Yeah, it's cool. I, and there's also I learned about a a lot of extinct arthropods with apparent brood care. Oh. Uh, the most interesting one was an arthropod called Aqualonifer, I believe, which was in the news not too long ago because what it looks like it did was it had these ribbon like. Uh, tail things that came off of its 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 rear, and the eggs and juveniles were attached to the little threads. Oh, like kites uh, floating in the water behind it. <laughs> that looks like that may be how it carried its young. Interesting. <laughs> Which is really cool. That's neat. Yeah. That's awesome. Trilobites are cool. They as far really, as invertebrates go, that that is. Uh when I touch on them at the aquarium uh, and so everyone knows it's not that I just visit the aquarium I, I work there uh, <laughs> you, Will goes to the aquarium and just, just tells people about news that's just what I do when I don't have some when I have downtime if I'm not doing errands uh, no so but talking about trilobites it's one of my favorite things is to point out is that because uh, you mentioned it with the pill bugs is they they really do look almost exactly like pill bugs or roly polies as uh, a lot of people call them as well uh but are their complete own group that is completely not here anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, and they were everywhere, and now they're not. Yeah. Which, when I first learned about that, blew my mind. That, yeah, you because know, like we still have remnants of dinosaurs, and you know the coelacanth is still around, and horseshoe crab is still around from almost the same time. Like their yeah. ancestors go back. Nothing from trilobites. Nope. And this wasn't a group that like popped up for a little while and didn't do very well and then disappeared. Trilobites were incredibly diverse and abundant for a few hundred million years. Which is, I think, one of the reasons that makes them so fascinating, especially when we are still learning things like this about them. You know, simple things like, well, did they lay eggs? Did the, where did their eggs come? <laughs> yeah. From? Like, and we don't even know. And the fact that we're still learning, but it's because 
you know, all fossil animals have that degree of you can never really know, but we don't even have a modern day analog to directly compare to them. Mm -hmm. We have guys that are a lot like them, but there's no one related to them other than distant relatives. So they are, their fossils are super numerous and that's all we'll ever have. And that's, I don't know that's like the epitome of paleontology is why there's I think they're so well known. Yeah. I actually in one of the, the the latest people that I interviewed for an article, he made a comment. This was about uh the Mesozoic mammal Didelphodon mm. where I asked him about what can what can we compare it to today? And he said he gave some examples and then he said that there may not be a perfect comparison. But that's the beauty of the fossil record. We find diversity that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Which is just, it's such a cool way to frame this concept that, yeah, no, we're looking at essentially alien creatures. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that are nothing like what we have anymore. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I got asked uh, at, at work one time, someone saying, during your time digging, have you guys ever found a new animal, like something unrecognizable. Right. Uh, and you know, in my case, and in, uh, in our case, it was one of those things where it's never been something to where we just held it up and go, what is this? But that has happened. Yeah. Where they found thing, especially early on when they pulled out a dinosaur skull and went, which way does it face? <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I have no idea what this is. Cause it was, or the famous, um, Hallucigenia was like that from the Cambrian, the Burgess Shale. Yes. Where for decades, <laughs> the debate was, if, do we have it right side up? Yes. <laughs> Which part does it walk with? <laughs> and we just didn't know because it's so weird. And that's fascinating. That is, that is yeah, super cool. Speaking of weird things. All right. Uh, your news article. <laughs> so next <laughs> one. Four. And then, and then we'll we'll uh, wrap up this section of news. Uh, is uh, this is also about sea creature? It is. They found the currently oldest con confirmed ancestor to chimeras. Uh, mm -hmm. And a little background on what a chimera is. Because it's a lion and yes, an eagle. A lion. Yeah. <laughs> I actually looked. Ended up looking up stuff about that uh, while <laughs> looking up stuff for this. Chimeras. <laughs> and some of the old art for those things are weird because it's what this original description was the front of a lion, the back of the snake, and the middle of a goat. That's all that was said in the original Iliad. <laughs> and so evidently, and my favorite thing is that there's weird interpretations of this that are the original pottery from that time. Huh. And it was literally a lion that sometimes had a snake head for a tail with a goat head just sticking out of the back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was for it. them as abstract as they could get. They were like, "Well, he said middle had a goat." And that's just sticking that's what on we did. Um, um, but this is not a goat lion snake no. creature. But it is named because of that that animal. Uh, so the chimeras are deep sea relatives of the shark. Uh, they're also known as ratfish or rabbit fish or ghost sharks and evidently elephant sharks as well. But I've yeah, I've heard that. I, you'll see ghost shark and ratfish most often when you look them yeah. up. Um, and they are cartilaginous fish. They have a cartilage skeleton instead of bone. Uh, they're, they were originally thought to be like super duper rare, but then as we got the equipment to go down deep more often, we found out that no, they're not. They're just where we couldn't reach. Hmm. And so there's evidently like 50 different species, which I did not know until looking this up. That's and cool. they're, they're much more common than we realized. But evidently in the past, it was almost the reverse to where they were the more common and the ancestors of sharks were either equal or less common. Interesting. In the, in the distant prehistoric past. Exactly. So huh. their ancestors were, many of what we thought were ancient sharks are turning out to be ancient chimeras is basically what this paper oh, cool. was talking about. Um, and so chimeras are really weird looking. They They use their pectoral fins the two on the side up front to flap to move themselves mm -hmm. and they have like all fish have expressionless face but they really have they just have like this <laughs> blank stare and their face doesn't really move and it's very it's a very uh, um 
rigid skull compared to like other sh- and so they're just really odd they don't use their tail to swim so they tend to just kind of flat they the flapping is basically all you they're really weird wow um that's that is bizarre yeah so they they found uh a, a man in south africa found it uh uh amateur paleontologist which is cool. cool uh and the last part is named after him now the name is is tricky so it's uh dwicus selecus Okay. Uh, and then the last part of it, the the species is named after the guy. So is it Dwicus selecusi? It's it's no. So Dwicus selecus is the the uh, genus name. The species is Usui zini, if I'm saying it right. But it's the huh. guy's name. It's the it's a South African oh, name. I see. I see. So I don't know if I'm saying that right, but uh, uh, I I chose all the papers with weird names. That was my yeah. goal today. That's why um. <laughs> <laughs> we want to show people that we're just like them. We're yes. fallible. Yes. I'd, yeah. That is my one. Like if I had to, if there was like the admit one embarrassing thing as a paleontologist, I'm really bad at pronouncing paleo names. <laughs> Words are not my, <laughs> I actually made a post on Twitter lately. There was a hashtag that was scientist superpower. And what I, what I tweeted was that I, I can pronounce taxonomic names on the first try. Yeah. I and that's my not. scientist superpower. I can not. Usually. I I almost every time I'm I have the issue of I say it the way I would have named it. Like I say yeah. it the way I want it to be pronounced and I get it really close but then I'll like skip a letter cuz the letter's weird and it shouldn't be there. Yeah. <laughs> it's Latin. It, it's we're we're trying to latinize our yeah, 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 it's weird. So, uh skull was found in rock and it was on display for quite a while. Uh Oh, the the paper by way is by a, a number of authors. The first one's uh, Michael Coates or uh, Coates. Um, but the they the guy found the fossil in the uh, uh, late nineteen nineteen uh, hundreds. Like I, it was like nineteen eighty or something. I think that he found it, hmm. and then they finally just recently were able to CT scan it, and so that's when they oh okay. So it was on display as a um. How do you pronounce it? The seminoid sharks. That sounds right. Um, and the famous one is the one with the flat scrub brush dorsal fin. Oh, Stethacanthus. Yes, Stethacanthus. Yeah. So that's part of this group, uh, and that's oh, basically okay. what this is talking about. It turns out a lot of those aren't sharks. Right, they're chimeras. They're chimeras. Um, and so if you guys look up a picture, it's the funniest looking shark it has a <laughs> we'll, flat we'll put all these links yes, up on the absolutely the it's, and it's super cool they ct scanned it and they found that the uh nerve passages the uh brain case the inner ear all belong to or were all features that belong to modern chimeras okay. uh, and so it just it revealed this this ancient link that they not only diverged, the fossil is about uh, 280 million years old and mm-hmm. revealed, it gives the earliest evidence of when they diverged from sharks so far. Also revealed that they were much more diverse in the past. And then evidently, the chimera fossil history and relation and exactly what their story is has been a big source of mystery up until now because being cartilaginous typically only their teeth plates right uh, right fossilized which i also learned they have teeth plates kind of like a stingray that's cool uh so they're like the opposite of the trilobite situation yes where it's the these animals were you can't miss them in some fossil sites yeah and so we know a ton about them but yeah cartilaginous animals soft-bodied animals Mm -hmm. are not common fossils uh and so now and it, once again, doing the side research opened a whole big Pandora's box of information about chimeras that take a lot more time to actually go into. But evidently, this has been a big part in unraveling big parts of that mystery for the people who study it, uh, which is really cool. That's cool. One of the coolest things for me when I, especially when we when we really got into uh, looking at zoology in graduate school in the paleontology program. And then reading papers and and going to conferences and stuff is that being involved in paleontology has taught me about 
groups of animals that I would not have otherwise known about, even living ones. Yes. Because there are a lot of animals like the chimeras that have a extensive, diverse fossil history that you wouldn't guess based on their relatively sort of, you know, they're not depauperate, but they're not really as big a deal in the oceans today as, say, sharks, whales, yeah. and well, everything the, else. You're, you're not going to find a documentary focused About on chimeras. chimeras. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. those animals that, that get fall by the wayside because they're not exciting. You know, they're yeah. not, you, you, you can't make a movie about them, so it's hard to make a documentary about them for yeah. Yeah. the That's typical true. general public. Uh, so they get lost by the wayside, except for like every now and then they'll show up on Blue Planet or Planet Earth. Right. But, so it's cool when you get to have those moments where you really can delve into an animal that typically never gets talked about. Yeah. It's cool stuff. The, um, the news for the past couple of weeks has actually been really full of cool paleontology and fossil and evolution stuff. Um, but we figure each episode we will uh, pick a couple of our favorites, talk about them. Uh, yeah, a- uh, after each episode we will have a blog post up. Yes. On our WordPress blog where you can get extra information and the first thing we'll put up on there is links to all this news uh, so our listeners can go ahead and check them out. Cool. All right. All right. So that's news. We should come up with a name for our news segment. I don't oh, know I what know. it is. Uh, in that case, do we also have to act like newscasters? Uh, back okay. to you, David. Um, and now we go over to Will <laughs> with some sort of strange fish. Yes. Uh, Will, that looks slimy. <laughs> it sure is. All right. All right. Anyway. So, uh, episode. That, tangents are part of our charm. So we tell ourselves. Uh. <laughs> I'm going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> All right. So the main discussion topic for uh, this episode, and i got to pull up my little outline here, is the, the field of paleontology as a whole. Um, there's a lot of... This is, paleontology, we've had this discussion before, and I claim that I think paleontology is not necessarily one of the least understood scientific fields, as goes the public, but perhaps one of the most misunderstood. Yes, I think that's There's a, good a lot of it. ideas out there about paleontology that, you know, there's a lot more to it, I think, than people expect, and some things that you expect to be in it aren't in it. Well, it has that weird... Um duality because everyone knows about the things we study dinosaurs right. safety cats all those yeah. cool things that make it into popular culture uh and then a handful of people you know know more than that but uh it's for as much as everyone knows those things you can still run across people all the time when you say oh i'm a paleontologist and they'll go what is that again yeah <laughs> you know, and it, that happens all the time, or they'll call you an archaeologist or whatever. So it's a weird, people know of the science, but they don't actually right. know what it is. Yeah, there's a lot of that confusion. Mm-hmm. So this episode, our discussion is going to be about the field. Uh, and this will be a cool opportunity for Will and myself to talk about some of our own experiences. Yes. So we are both, uh, we both uh, were in the same graduate program. Mm -hmm. We got our master's degree uh, focus in paleontology. So we've done some research. We've done pretty much all the steps that we're going to talk about. And now we've transitioned over to uh, more communication uh, and education type stuff. But Leia, let's start off with just what is it and what do we do and what do we study? Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned archaeology. Do you want to... So, yeah, so that's hit that one. That's uh, that's always kind of my when I define it, uh, and uh, I've been figuring out the best way to do that in a, a non-related setting because I'm trying to do mm-hmm. the, a paleo tour at the aquarium, which is not a yeah. place you typically people aren't coming in there expecting it, so they're not. Uh, yeah. you it's a delightful of, surprise. Yeah, yeah, surprise define. dinosaurs. Yep, boom, fossils. Um. <laughs> 
<laughs> boom. Uh, did you say boo or did you say boom? Boo. Either one is fine. Yeah, I said boo. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so paleontology, archaeology, the, the biggest difference is they both study things from the past, but paleontology studies at its simplest and at its core fossils, while archaeology mm-hmm. studies artifacts. And artifacts come from uh, human or hominid civilizations. So it's things they left behind, yeah. buildings, tools, weapons, while paleontologies, the fossil is things left behind by living organisms. Typically the parts of the organism itself or traces left by that organism. Right. Uh, I think the fossils versus artifacts uh, distinction is a really good one. Yeah. It's archaeologists, it's stuff people made. Yes. And paleontologists is everything else. Yes. And they'll overlap when you have, like, bones left over at a campsite. Yes. And that's the few times they overlap, but typically they're... And they're also also usually separated by age. Yeah. Archaeologists can only go back so far. Yeah, before you run out of civilization. Yeah. Before yeah. It's, it's, it stops showing up because it hasn't shown up. Yeah. But everything before that, and even the earliest records of human evolution, uh, fall pretty squarely within paleontology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Will mentioned earlier when you, when you talked about it, the famous things. Dinosaurs, saber-toothed cats. We talked about trilobites. Yes. Um, so there are certainly sort of rock stars of paleontology. But paleontology, anything that is alive today has ancient relatives that are in the fossil record. Yes. So paleontologists can study anything living. Plants, fungi, bacteria, any kind of animal. You know, I, we know people who study, you know, birds or fish or insects and you know and there's just a whole literally everything alive uh fits into that fossil record and uh it's also it's an interesting field cuz it it has so many specializations but it also has a myriad of offshoots um that mm-hmm. so it's it's often when i i'm describing paleontology to someone it's hard to know how much of the excess to include in uh cuz we're both vertebrate paleontologists, so we study things with yeah, bones. True. We don't really, like, as much of a fan we may be of trilobites, insects, and those things, that's not our field of focus. And vice versa, right. you can get ver- invertebrates who really can't tell you, can't walk you around a skull because their guys don't have them. Right. But then you also get things like uh, paleobotanists who just study plants and then paleoclimatologists. People who are yeah. focusing at looking at what can the fossils tell us about the climate, yes, not the animal. And they're still using fossils. They're still studying those things, but they're looking at it for a whole different reason. And there's a whole slew of those. Anthropology being one of those that is a paleo study, but is focusing on human ancestors. Right. Paleoanthropology specifically. Yeah. Is that and yeah? There's all sorts of cool names. Uh, I've heard zooarchaeology yes. for animals at archaeological sites, which is cool. But you make a really good point that it's not just, you know, it, it isn't just hey, we found this skull. Let's let's slap a name on it, and we'll talk more about you know specifics of research. Yeah. But um, you know, you can study ecosystems and environments and long-term trends through evidence from the fossils. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, and that uh, similar when we were talking about the, the giant pterosaur, you know, that it's cool to learn about that giant, you know, monster stork creature, yeah. but it's also really telling of that animal's ecosystem mm-hmm. and what else may have been around on that island and what that uh, environment may have been like. So it's there's a lot you can tell through the study of the living creatures, and that's uh, kind of brings us in the next little part of mm-hmm. uh, why you know, which is what uh, you touched on there. Like it's some some of it is just fascinating. Like it's it's yeah, 
being people who are passionate about it, we can't help but to study it because who doesn't want to know about the giant monster pterosaur <laughs> or yeah. other crazy creatures? Um, but that is, and I and I I know you've got them too. But that is one of the most common questions that we get oftentimes is either what's the point or what can you do? You know, like right. they, what? Why? Why do you do this? Where you know? It's it's funny because the two big sources that ask that question are like the interested public, you know, museum crowd kind yeah. of people, interested public, and um, grant providers. Yes. And so it's funny that being able to answer the question of what good is this is actually really important mm-hmm. for for working scientists. Because you have to, you know, you, you sometimes have to justify what you're studying. And in an ideal world, the fact that it's awesome would be enough. Yes. Well, it's and it, yeah. the art for art's sake argument, which most people, you know, are willing to defend. Yeah. It's for, for whatever reason, it's harder for typically people to defend science for science's sake. Yeah. There's also the fact that um, in addition to being cool, a lot of the times throughout the history of science, you get to, you know, you've been studying something for 50 years, and then you realize what you found. Mm-hmm. You look back and go, oh, now, it all makes you know, sense. penicillin yes. or whatever, you know, some sort of cool new innovation comes out of it. Um, and it's just building that knowledge. Or even more so, it's you studied something your whole life. And another guy studied the similar thing his whole life and someone else. And then a third person, you know, a fourth person looks back at all of that research and goes, oh, hey, did you guys realize you figured this out? Uh, I'll put it all yeah. together for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Long it's always beneficial. Yeah. It's always beneficial to have, uh, to gather information. Yeah. There's no downside um, to it. The answer that I always like to give that's more specific is that, you know, paleontology lets us do a few things that no one else can do. One of them being uh, to study ecosystems over extremely long periods of time. Yes. You know, we've only had access to modern science and ecological studies for a few hundred years, maybe, at most. Yeah. A th- you know, we've only been around for a number of thousands of years, and we've only been paying attention for so so much of that time. Exactly. You know, we don't know what happens to a forest. You know, 500 years is not a lot of time for a forest. It's not even a lot of time for a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you want to know what happens over long periods or what happens when this, what happens when the climate changes, what happens when a major part of the ecosystem goes extinct, what happens when another organism comes in all these changes we can study through the fossil record it's 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 hundreds of millions of years of experiment of natural experimentation that exactly. we can access it, it gives us uh reference points that that's yes. how i've always looked at it you know because you have studies that have gone on for like over a hundred years where some institute has been watching a lake or a forest or right. an ice flow whatever it is and they've been, which are always fascinating and super cool, but as you mm-hmm. pointed out, like, 100 years, you're really only glimpsing a snapshot yeah. of what takes typically thousands or millions of years uh, to happen in its entirety. So, f- paleo studies give us that look at the the reference to, we think this is what's happening Let's look at when that has happened. Yes. To see what we might want to expect, or what we could expect, or what to keep an eye out for to see if it's following that trend. Uh, right. And yeah, it's very important for conservation questions, yes. especially today. That's usually my biggest uh, reference when people ask is that conservation and climate studies are the two biggest things that it has an effect on because it's the two biggest things that it can study. And yeah. gives us uh, prediction answers. Uh, yeah, for or at the very happens. least, the two biggest things that are hot ticket, yes. sort of hot topic yes. items that these is, days. That is also you know, those are big important mm-hmm. concepts. Uh, the other thing that I always like to point out is that paleontologists are also the only 
scientists, well, all right, geol you know, anyone who yeah. studies, you know, I'll give, you know, nod to geologists as well. Um, but these are the only disciplines that can access a world without humans. Yeah. And it, you know, it's nearly impossible to tease apart in the modern world human influence versus non-human influence. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at, you know, what does what does a forest look like when it's not being polluted or cut down, when it's not suffering from, you know, climate effects or, or atmospheric changes, that's in the fossil record. Yeah. And we can find that. This is also, you know, this comes up a lot with uh, climate change, where it's like the reason that we, you know, one of the big reasons we're so alarmed, the scientific community is so, is so alarmed about what the climate is doing, is because we have access to what it's done mm -hmm. for thousands and millions of years, and this is new. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the specifics that are happening are not quite what you'd expect uh, looking at past uh, instances, so... And that's that's what gets missed in translation so often is uh, the scale of the time being looked at is because uh, uh, it's having a conversation with my dad about that. And he's he's a bit more on the conservative side and he uh, was having those sort of like, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about climate change, but I also hear what these people are saying. And right. Right. Uh, but when I mentioned it's like the the data we're looking at goes back thousands of like before human civilization ever started it was the yeah. first time he was like oh i didn't i like that's it's never how it, it's made to sound is that you're looking yeah. at it from truly before humans were even able to start affecting it you know yeah it's that prehistoric perspective that really baseline yeah no it's great so that um you know that's what paleontology is. That's what paleontologists study. It's a little bit. You know, we're t the, we're we're going to be breezing over these topics uh, real quick. We could do a, an entire episode on all of these. Yes. Sort absolutely. of bullet points we're going to hit, but um, we'll work our way through the process of paleontology. And the process starts, and this is perhaps the most famous aspect of paleontology, is excavation. Yes. Uh, and we both have uh, a, a good deal of experience digging up fossils. Um, do you want to talk some about your own experience? Yeah, definitely. Because because uh, uh, I've actually only ever been to the one site, even though I uh, was there for quite a while. But uh, mm -hmm. we we both dug at uh, the fossil site in Gray, Tennessee. Gray fossil site. Maybe we can put links as well. Um, yeah, we'll put links up. And yeah, absolutely. Pictures and Promote stuff. Promote them. Uh, <laughs> they, it's a, it's a, a really awesome fossil site. I mean, we we both kind of fell in love with it. Um, it was a clay deposit, about on average five million years old, but somewhere between four and seven million years old, and a huge deposit. Uh, and the coolest thing is it was almost the complete opposite of what typically gets shown for yes. <laughs> paleontology excavation. Because typically you see people chipping away at stone out in the badlands of Colorado or Nevada or something. Yep. And I've actually done that as well. I worked a, a one summer at a site chipping away at stone yeah. in Colorado, which was dinosaurs way older. Yes. And yeah, the rock was so hard that we were chiseling it. And it was, you know, we'd dig all day and maybe find a couple things, whereas the gray site was like shoveling through Play-Doh. Yeah, it, we used uh, little hand trowels, just little gardening tools that you would, mm -hmm. they, they looked like uh, little spackles. Um, yep. And you would just take off a little bit of a time, because the big thing about the gray site is the fossils were so well preserved. And this is the case with lots of sites that as... Uh, People, as people started using new techniques, they realized lots of little fossils were getting missed because people were only looking for the big ones. Yeah. The gray site is this instance to the nth degree. There are so many micro fossils, itty bitty rodents and yep. frog and fish and chips of bone that if you dig any more aggressively than using those small trials and taking just a little bit of time, you're going to destroy something very quickly. Yeah. 
Uh, so it was a very low energy, uh, but very time consuming. Like we would take the yeah. entire summer to dig down five feet. Yeah. Uh, and so it would take three months of, you know, sometimes up to 12 people digging to get a pit down to just four or five feet because there was partially so much to be found there and because the technique was a very delicate one. Yeah. But um, in that time, you would find, ton like, if you went a day at the gray site without finding something cool, it was a weird day. It was weird. That's a that's a really off day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the when when I when I left uh, slightly after which uh, was only slightly after David left there, uh, the number of specimens that had been found at that site in the uh, twelve years that it, they'd been excavating it was sixteen thousand <laughs> specimens. It had just it had just cusped Oof. sixteen right yeah. when I was leaving. I don't know what they're at now because now they found. The mastodons. Now they're fine. Yeah, th this is a site that, like Will said, was about five million years old or so. So it's, you know, alligators, rhinos, snakes, lizards, turtles, some saber-toothed material, things like that. The famous red panda. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, just about as soon as we left, our friend Sean started digging up elephants. He, he basically just decided to dig in the right spot. He did the research to figure out where to dig and... Fa the elephants we knew we had because we had found pieces, and now they have yeah. four skulls. I think it's four. I, think it might, well, I mean, I haven't talked to them in a while. It might be more now. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> just... They were just coming up out of the ground everywhere. <laughs> uh, so that's, it, that's it, been my whole experience excavating. And uh, But there are, from everyone I've talked to, it's basically a different experience depending on where you dig because every bit yeah. of earth is going to be, you know, what type of rock, where you are. Is it wet? Because there's a site. Just uh, oh, north yeah. of us, that was the known as the Mammoth site, and it was also mud and clay and everything, but it was still wet, so it was a completely yeah. different... This was the, the Saltville site. Yeah, Saltville. Yeah. It's interesting. That's what I always like to tell people, is that there's, no, there's very little in the way of consistent approach, consistent environment. Surprisingly little, because... Yeah. The gray site was clay, and you find stuff all the time. And the bathrooms were right there, because yeah. it was in the backyard of the museum. The Colorado site was super hard stone, and we were camping out, and it was 100-something degrees. And then I worked, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I did excavations at a site in South Dakota, where it was an hour and a half up a mountain, and then in a cave, 40 feet down the into the whole entrance of this cave... And this was like, you know, 10, 15,000 year old stuff. So really, really young. And it was all tiny stuff that yep. had washed in there and accumulated. And we didn't really do much excavation in the cave. It was, you'd scoop, slowly scoop out the sediment in a methodical way. And then most of it, we washed through it. Mm -hmm. We would hose over it and the water would wash away the dirt. And that's when we would find all the stuff. Yeah. I, I uh, went... So the technique is... You know, oh, it's completely different. Yeah, you know, when you find a new site, you have to figure out what technique is going to work best here. Yeah, it's it's constantly discovering how do you handle these. And when we talk about fossil prep, it's the same thing of how you what it was buried in depends on how you then handle it after the fact. Yep. Uh, I I went caving with them one time when they were looking at a site for um for Nate's uh. They were looking at it for oh, me yeah, and for, um, uh, uh, I think it was Matt's, um, their thesis. Uh, and this this was, once again, fossil, uh, a fossil cave site. A lot of the stuff was on the surface, uh, which right. is the cool thing about caves is it's not a lot of burying going on. It's very much just things died there and then nothing yeah. bothered them. <laughs> uh, we didn't do any excavation when I went on that trip. Uh, and they had times where they were went to excavate and offered for people to come back, and I did not go back because that was when I learned that I like caves you can stand up in the whole way and are meant for tourists. <laughs> <laughs> that's and that's another interesting point is that uh, in the cave in South Dakota there were a few spaces 
that were you know sometimes excavation is really uncomfortable yeah well it's uh, there are, uh go ahead no as jim uh one of our professors uh had a story about his friend who was excavating in a cave and he had found a little alcove uh and he had started to see some good material there so he started to dig and just absentmindedly, he had his light, he was digging, and he would push the dirt off to the side. And without realizing mm-hmm. it, he was blocking the entrance to the alcove. <laughs> ah. And he noticed it when he began to become lightheaded, because he was blocking off his oxygen supply. <laughs> and he almost passed out alone in that part of the cave, which is how people Ooh. die and are not heard yeah. of for years. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's terrifying. And that's we had one moment when we were in the cave where... Uh, the professor with Blaine decided to stop and look at something. Mm -hmm. And then we went to catch up with the group. And this was uh, a really crazy cave. Like when you looked at the map, it was just cross hatching. Like the cave systems were following the stone and the stone had a square geometry to its makeup. Right. So when the water ran through it, it created these grid system labyrinth. Interesting. And we caught up with them in a different route than they had taken by just following their light and noise. And (laughs) it was too close to us getting stuck or lost. (laughs) And I was like, all right, that is good enough for my cave experience. Wow. I remember reading about um, Neil Shubin, who was one of the people that discovered the famous Tiktaalik. Yeah. Uh, Their excavations were in the Arctic. Yes. And the description of how that goes is basically they'd have a helicopter drop them off and leave them there for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And that was excavation. Yeah. And you needed to be ready. You need to have all your supplies. And they could only dig certain parts. You know, the summertime when it's not deathly freezing. Uh, There was another expedition that recently went down to Antarctica. So, yeah, excavation, you know, the variety in, in excavation sites and excavation procedures is incredible yeah. it's always cool to see a new site well and then you have things like the La Brea tar pit or the um was it uh asphalt uh, yeah nebraska yeah where it's indoors yes where they have <laughs> they have had enough time and funds to encompass the entire site to protect it from the weather yeah uh and it's just inside where it can be air conditioned <laughs> yeah that's the next step up from gray yeah they've talked about it <laughs> Yeah, they yeah. Did. We, we we would put those big um, pavilions. Uh, co- the they weren't tents, but they were big metal covers. Yeah, like the uh, mobile pavilion. Um, so excavation, of course, is the first and famous part. The next part, the next step, is probably the most overlooked step. Absolutely. Like the ratio of how important fossil preparation is to how much attention it. It sort of gets in. I yeah, you know, there's the minds of of the general public when they think about it, is definitely more than any other section of paleontology. Oh, absolutely, well, especially uh, because it without it you really couldn't have much paleontology. Yeah, you can't do research. Yeah, you can't do research on something that's still locked in stone or is broken, shattered into a bajillion pieces. Yep. So fossil prep. Um, is the process of cleaning the fossils, repairing the fossils, removing... You know, it, it, uh, when you find something big in a lot of sites, it gets wrapped in plaster mm-hmm. to p- keep it safe and still, and you bring it inside. Fossil prep is opening it up, carefully removing everything. It, it's it's a much more... It, it's almost always a much longer process than that, excavation at the museum one of the things uh when we would get to that point in the tour the point that would always uh, i would always stress to make and uh was that because of the delicateness of this project uh and sometimes the complexity because i mean there's been many a time in early fossil history where fossils were prepped incorrectly and put together wrong because yep. It was either lack of knowledge because it was the first time they'd found an iguanodon, so they didn't know where to put the thumb, or (laughs) it was a a place that was not trained. So they, you know, Sean would tell me to me horror stories about how the traditional way of doing it in lots of countries and in the past was just you uncovered most of it in the rock or mud, and then you just poured super glue over it. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> and that's another interesting part is that a lot of research goes into preparatory methods. Yes. 
There's whole um, because, sections on it. Yeah, and yeah, the paleontology conferences at SVP, mm-hmm. uh, which will come up in this podcast a ton, because yes. it's the main vertebrate paleontology conference. Um, the SVP meeting always has sections for preparators. Yes. Uh, and there have been, you know, uh, all, you know, preparators always have stories about how this one specimen that was prepared 50 years ago that they used a glue that they thought was good and it was good for the first, you know, 10, 20, 30 years and then started eating the fossil yeah, or discoloring the fossil or something. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of work and a lot of unique techniques have to go into finding the right way to keep the fossils safe, keep them stable, remove them from the sediment. Uh, because of all that, the the amount of time between something being unearthed and being researched can be, and that that's always the, the point I remember and I love when it's mentioned in articles, is like the Chimera one, where it, it was found in the 80s, and... Yep. Only now has it been fully studied, but there's tons of times where something gets dug up and either prepared or set aside to be prepared, and then there's enough other stuff that it sits on the shelf for 10 years, or it yeah. takes them the better part of a year to get it prepared, and then you can have to take a whole another year to research it. Yep. Uh, so even things that are hot, t- you know, hot ticket items that everyone wants to research could take you two or three years before you actually get the paper out about it. Yep. And that's after the excavation. Yeah, that's after it's out of the ground. Uh, A lot of paleontologists that I've spoken to, especially in recent years, as I get to talk to more people and write about news, um, a lot of them are really keen on acknowledging the efforts of the excavators and the preparators. Yeah. Because they don't, you know, it's sort of the unsung, you know, heroes is, is uh, you know, uh, a very superlative phrase. But yeah. yeah, you know, these are people doing a ton of work um, and they're not always degree holding paleontologists. You get a lot of amateurs, a lot of volunteers yes. that help out with this stuff. Um, that's what we, you know, at the Gray site we did a ton of prep work and I consider that all volunteer. <laughs> like I, you know, I was learning Oh yeah. for the first time. I, I would delight in taking time to learn how to do all that stuff. Absolutely. Well, I mean, so we had volunteers that were working in that lab on putting fossils back together that did not have a degree, but that had been working at that lab for 15 years. Yeah. You know. People that knew way more than we did. Oh yeah. And we were earning our masters in it. Yeah. Uh, and that's the the cool thing on the excavation and the prep is that they do go hand in hand where how you excavate something is constantly learning process and how you prep it is constantly learning but yep. how you excavated the fossil that's now to be prepped can affect one another to where yes. we we would often remove the fossils in very particular ways on request of the lab so that it would be easier for them to work on it come yep. the time to actually get it out of the jacket and put it together. I've been volunteering at a Mike Demick's lab at Adelphi, and he does dinosaurs that come out of Wyoming and uh, uh, places way out west. And he has recently made the switch to a different kind of plaster jacketing material that's easier to open. Because mm-hmm. you get the big jackets, and they're like a cast you put on your arm. When it comes time to take those off, you know, I use a Dremel. Yes, to saw, you know, I'm power sawing through it to open it. And so when you're out in the field, you have to consider, you know, how easy is this going to be to undo Yeah. when it comes time to, to solve, you know, to fix this in the lab. Well, I mean, because there were some of the big jackets when we'd find a, a piece of rhino or a, a full tapir, or, and I can mm-hmm. only imagine with the, the mammoth stuff, where we would have to put rebar. They would put yeah. pieces of rebar to reinforce <laughs> the cast. Uh, and it's like you're getting into architecture at that point. Where yes. like, <laughs> now it's carpentry. Yeah, where they are putting structural supports. Uh, and some of these things would weigh hundreds of pounds. Oh, uh, yeah. And then you have to get into the lab and cut the whole thing in half into what they call the clamshell. And then they have to delicately remove everything. So it's. Yeah. You know, there's definitely and those we moments even... of 
in hindsight, we should have done it this way because it would have yeah. taken us a month instead of three. Yeah. Uh, and then we should make a very brief mention, just to make sure we put it out there, of the delicacy of repairing fossils. Yeah. Sometimes it's easy and it's like three pieces and they snap right back together. Our friend Sean, who was uh, the head preparator uh, much of the time we were there, was... It's so funny because Sean's a big guy. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's a big guy, yeah. but he is so good. He was incredible at finding the fits for these tiny little fragmented pieces. Uh, it's it's a real skill. And so just, just as I mentioned, because this is something that I find many people don't realize about fossils, is the majority, like the vast majority, in the 90%, if not more than that, of fossils are damaged to some degree. Oh yeah, like, no, they're yeah, absolutely. I, you do it, when you find a fossil that's undamaged, it'll typically be a single bone, and every other bone because there's thousands of tons of pressure being put on them by the earth as it buries them and turns the. I mean, it's enough pressure to turn the dirt they're in into stone, so yeah. they are getting crushed and misshapen and warped and twisted and if they died in some violent way they could get broken bones that then shift apart as the body disintegrates and yeah. rots. Or they could get stepped on. They could get eaten by something. So they're yeah. usually broken and we would get especially and unfortunately the most important pieces, things like skulls which are hollow just yep. get crushed like an eggshell and yeah, Sean would be able to put together uh, the fossil, the gray fossil site had amazingly preserved things, but they were often uh, crushed pretty thoroughly. And he would reconstruct a skull out of easily a few hundred pieces. Like yeah. once you counted every single shard, it had to be close to 200 individual shards of bone <laughs> that he put together. Uh, and it was, it was, he was, he was amazing and utterly humbling to watch when he was at work <laughs> yeah it was it, crazy it's definitely it's funny because excavation it's easy to look at it and say oh i would love to join that yeah i could do that and yeah for the most part you can you just have to be careful yeah. prep work there are aspects of prep work where i absolutely no i could i couldn't do that at least not to the degree that that this person is so finding a good preparator is really, really important for oh, yeah. museums and universities uh, dealing with fossils. Like, the bulk of the work I did in the lab was uh, picking, which is looking for itty-bitty fossils that came from the clay as we washed it, like uh, David was talking about with the cave material. And yep. we would find itty-bitty vertebrae and teeny tiny things, and it's all done under a microscope with tweezers. Yep. Um the easy stuff yeah that that's that's it's very straightforward basically the skill comes in learning how to recognize when you're looking at bone right. uh and we get lots of plant material too i really enjoyed it because i'm a very i like i like tedious little processes and stuff <laughs> there was one day yeah. where he was like hey do you want to try out cleaning some things so i was like yeah sure and then he handed me and my immediate reaction once i sat down and was in front of the bones was like are you are you sure <laughs> like, like I was. Im I might break it. Yeah, I was immediately <laughs> self-conscious of like, I don't want to do anything wrong because this, this is a this is a big piece of a fossil now that I'm handling. I, the other yeah. stuff was already clean; it'd been washed. All I have to do is pick it up, and we had flexible tweezers, so I couldn't even crush it if you know unless I really tried to. <laughs> like, yep. As soon as I was handed an actual piece of bone, I was a lot more self-conscious and uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh yeah, and that's I, I have that with um, you know you you open a jacket and I get this at Adelphi nowadays. I'll open a jacket and it's like all right, you know I I sawed through this thing, and opened it up and here is a a dinosaur leg. Yeah, and now I this thing is in my care, for at least a little bit. I always have that whenever I would go into a a museum collection. Um, I remember <laughs> there was one time that our professor Blaine. Uh, I think I think this was when I was doing this for Blaine. He had asked me to take some pictures of alligator uh, fossils for him. And I think I was at the museum in New York. And there was one specimen that he wanted that was in the top drawer 
of this cabinet. And so I was up on the, the, the stepladder and I had my hands up above my head and I was pulling the thing out and I brought it down and it's this is the holotype, which means it is the original <laughs> specimen, like the first one by which this species is described. Yeah. And I'm standing on a stepladder s- holding this thing in a drawer. And in my mind, I'm seeing the cinematic image of me slipping off the stepladder and just throwing this fossil across the room. I always get super nervous, you know, I, at least early on, I would always get that like, oh, I, this is a really important, yeah. really cool uh, fossil that I'm holding. And that's that's really the the biggest part of fossil prep to me that uh, makes it such of a vital importance is that it's not just that you're putting together something that's millions of years old. You might be putting together the only one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and realistically, a lot of them are the only one. Yeah, there's many animals that we have yeah. one fossil representation of, and that is it, because either the animal did not fossilize well, or we just haven't dug in the right places yet to find the others. And statistically speaking, there's got to be some species of animal that only has one fossil somewhere. So yeah. there's so many times where you might be working with the one or one of two, the second yeah. one. And so yep. how it gets preserved will affect future paleontologists. Yeah. Indeed. Speaking of the future paleontologists, the, the next section... Uh, And this is the obvious one. This is research. You've excavated the fossil. You've cleaned, prepared, repaired, all that, sorted it out. Um, Paleontological research is all about what we can learn from these ancient organisms. And it, this is a really diverse field as far as research questions and research methods goes. Uh, There are some obvious things, you know, obviously you're looking at anatomy Obviously, you're looking for how did these animals or, or plants or whatever, you yeah. know, how did it live? How, how did it, it get its food? How did it function? All that stuff. But you can get in. There's chemistry that you can get involved in to, to learn about organisms, physiology or diet. Physics comes into play when yep. you're studying biomechanics. You know, how how strong were its jaws? How did the, the pterosaur we were talking about? How strong was the neck? Yeah. And how strong was the head? Yeah, there's it's it's really cool um the the variety of questions you can ask and the variety of methods you can use to answer them well and it's uh this one it, the first thing when i first started getting into research in grad school or really learning the papers was because you're researching for the most part a limited supply of things now, there are definitely yeah. fossils that have gone without research because they're either they it's harder to get funding or they're just not as popular. So that, that definitely yeah. happens where there's certain fossils that have a lack of research for them. But with the big items, you know, like dinosaurs, you know, everyone has done some sort of research on T Rex. So you get the <laughs> when if you want to do a research paper on T Rex, you have to figure out something that someone else hasn't done yet. So yeah. you get these really really crazy minute detail studies that are looking at all right all right we've looked at how strong its bite is we've looked at this we've looked at this have we looked at how its toe muscles you might find <laughs> you know like really really particular things which still adds to the body of knowledge but you get some really crazy concepts as you look for research topics yeah and one of the things with, you know, it, 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 we shouldn't give the impression that like, you know, you're, you're just looking for a piece of the pie or something no, to, but to find something, if you, but if it's definitely your... true that if you have a dinosaur, or, you know, a, 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 a specimen, something mm-hmm. like T-Rex that you have a surprising amount of good fossil material for, someone's going to study those pieces. Exactly. Uh, so you joke about the toe bones, but people have actually studied them, yeah, you know. exactly. Like you... uh, the arms. There was a whole study about arm strength, at least one arm strength mm-hmm. in T-Rex, and that can tell you what it was doing with its arms. It gives you evolutionary context for it and its relatives. Yeah, that was always you know. the most the, the, the most interesting part of it was 
the range of things that could be studied on one group or animal or even one individual fossil. You know, when you get famous fossils like Lucy, you know, oh, yeah. every single aspect of that fossil has been looked at forward and backward because it's such a fascinating specimen. Everyone, you know, everyone wants to know every detail you can tease out of it. So, yeah. And there's still... Yeah. You know, the, the studies on fossils like that are not stopping anytime soon. As technology improves and as other fossils are found, uh, whole new subjects can be opened up uh, to look into it. Yeah. Uh, we should talk uh, briefly, because we haven't mentioned this yet, about what our research was. Yeah. So we both did research uh, through our time in grad school and uh, since. Um, yeah, most paleontologists have a specialty either in what kinds of things they study or what kinds of methods they use. Yes. Um, so, for example, I, I studied mostly small reptiles. I did snakes, lizards, turtles. And most of my studies were really just identifying and characterizing ecosystems. What lived here? What were, you know, we've got six species. What were they? Um, are they new species? Are they this? Yeah. Does their presence tell us something interesting about the ecosystem? Oh, this one is an aquatic species. You know, various, you know, bits and pieces like that. Um, which is which is always really cool because you, you know, you to learn about an ecosystem, you need all the pieces. Yeah, it's, it's or like at least as many of them as you can. An environmental census is... is yeah, often. so you're, cat you know, it's cataloging that... Uh, ecosystem. Yeah. So most of my work was in that, and my specialty was small reptiles, uh, which are, of course, the best animals. Uh, they are very close. Um, they are the best they, snakes and lizards specifically. They are. I chose to study them because they're the best animals <laughs> in the world. They are past very and, past and present. They are very close. Uh, you may not be familiar with the actual best, which is crocodilians. Uh, I. <laughs> I, I know of an animal by that name. <laughs> I've heard of them. <laughs> but I, I think we must be talking about something different. Have they done much work recently? I don't Do they have legs? Because <laughs> if so, I think... They have too I many. I think you might be wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so crocodilians are my specialty, um, and that's, 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 that's just always been my passion is their favorite animal and everything. But my uh, research that I did was on the skull of the modern alligator, uh, which is something a lot of people don't realize about paleontology is many paleontologists uh, may not specialize in it, but they will often study modern animal in-depth studies into modern animals. Oh, yeah. Because how else are you going to learn about the musculature or something of a past one? You know, you can see right. where the muscles might have attached, but you won't know how they were shaped. Is a Is this animal's, you know, muscular cells different? So I was looking at the skull of alligators and how they change as they grow. And this is in a great example of one of those uh, specialized or closer looks at something that has been studied. Because research has been done on every single species of crocodilian, which is alligators, crocodiles, caimans, and the gharial, on how their skull changes shape as they grow. Uh, mm -hmm. The first paper was actually done... I can't remember if it was the early 1900s. It was by Mook, which, but he, <laughs> yeah, he wrote two big papers. One describing the differences in skull bones of each species, and then one describing how they change as they age. Like, cool. He did those big studies, and then people have done more detailed ones since then. But I was looking at the individual bones. So mm -hmm. uh, me and my my advisor came up with it. But it was looking at how did the you know, bones of the nose and the bones of the jaw and the bones at the back of the skull change individually. Interesting. Yeah. Which so, is very useful for paleontology, exactly. of course. Because most of the time, you don't get the whole skull. Yeah. You might only get one or two bones. Uh, and so that was very much what uh, my study was in. Uh, I have not done t uh, a great deal of research since because I learned through that process that as much as I loved getting the results, being a full-time researcher was not... Yeah, it's we, very we, time consuming. <laughs> this is a thing that we share yes. is that we've done research, we experienced research. Mm -hmm. I would not turn up my nose at an opportunity to do more research no, in and the I future. Have research I'd like to do at some point. Right. But I it's not going to be our main. It really just like 
how prep work takes a particular set of skills and a particular kind of person, so does research. Yeah, uh, it's a nonstop job, and once you finish one paper, you need to start on the next. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's great stuff, uh, and we'll talk more uh, sort of about what we do now. Yeah, uh, in our final section, not right. to make this sound like it's uh, you know little chunks of of our episode but there are little chunks of our uh, episode we're working our way through an outline otherwise we we would just it would be nothing but tangents no (laughs) otherwise we would have been talking about uh the marvel cinematic universe oh it would have gotten this entire time yeah it would have it would have been 10 minutes in (laughs) that would have been it did you see did you see the last agents of shield yet no and then then that would have been it It i still need to catch up i just but okay sorry (laughs) anyway uh, before we get off of research, <laughs> uh, I do want to uh, make mention of the fact that, uh, well, for, uh, your point about studying modern animals is a really good one. Yeah. Um, because we study modern animals for all sorts of info and plants and, you know, all sorts. As you can see, Will and I are, as you mentioned before, very biased towards vertebrate yes. creatures. Um, but, you know, looking at living organisms offers so much cool insight into their evolution. And so on our on this podcast, we will certainly go into discussions of living, cool yes. living creatures and what they can tell us about the past. Um, but the other thing that I, I wanted to make mention of before we, we uh, before I forget is that right now is such a cool time for paleontological research because more and more we're getting it the ability to do studies we could not have done yeah. 30, 20, sometimes even five or 10 years ago. Um, when you go to the conferences these days, there's entire sections on ancient DNA studies, yeah. on chemical analyses, it's, on uh, it's using a... computer models uh, to, to model movement and to model ecosystem dynamics. Yeah, the, the uh, they... technological renaissance is, is what it feels like we're in. Yes. Like technology is really, like, and as it always has in science, open doors as it progresses. But within our lifetime, like, three or four major new fields of CT scanning fossils, being able yep. to 3D print things trapped in stone, being able to do genetic research, chemical analysis, have not only exploded, but some of them have completely emerged come into existence yeah. <laughs> within our lifetime of of being interested in paleontology yeah it's this this last svp uh which was this past november um had for the first time ever an entire symposium an entire morning session devoted to molecular paleontology which is studying you know remains of proteins and and chemical traces and molecular traces of things like pigment molecules which um, still blows my mind which is just the cool you know and and this is something that you know 10 years ago would have been so oh no nah, yeah no yeah, may may they yeah. were never going to find that kind of stuff and that's too detailed and and that's the, but now it's you know now there's entire debates about this data you know, how we're interpreting it and this and that. And it's just, we're really in a, in a, a rapidly developing field. It's, and, it, and it's, uh, you know, this goes for so many sciences, but the once you know to look for something the first time you find it, it's amazing what you then start to find. Yeah. You know, and that, that's basically what's been happening with so many things is as people have, you know, someone did it the first time, found something other people did it too and almost everyone found something and realized yeah. oh we've just been overlooking this because we didn't know to look for it we didn't know it was there yeah. and we didn't have the technology uh, or the understanding to recognize what it was yeah so it the, the research it, it, there's so much and and we'll it'll come up every podcast episode as we talk about news and things yes. Uh, but the final, the final piece of paleontology, the final major section, uh, we've dug them up, we've prepped the fossils, we've researched the fossils, and this is the one that I think, you know, people might not even realize how big a part this is, and this is communication. Yeah. 
this is outreach and teaching. Spreading that news. Yeah, because if this information, you know, it's great if, if it stays within the scientific community and they know and they can research it, but, you know, science is a, a communal endeavor. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a, not serving a, a huge purpose if it's if we're the only ones that get to play with it. <laughs> yes. So communication and education are what Will and I do these days. Yes. Uh, I am a science writer, and I write about cool modern living things and cool evolutionary things, and as much as I can, I write about fossil stuff. Uh, yeah. We both used to do museum tours. Yes. In Tennessee. We were kind uh, of the, now you have a you do a new thing. Yeah, we were kind of both the, the general educators at the, at that museum. We did a little bit of outreach and everything else. And I, I've now transitioned to doing very similar stuff at the Florida Aquarium in mm-hmm. Tampa, uh, where I developing and give other tours. And so now it's uh, I'm I'm learning many new skills because I'm not a fish person at all yeah. so i had to learn most of my fish info like i knew general stuff but i had to learn yeah. the specifics of what fish is that uh while working here and i i very much came to learn about living animals but behavioral and you know those kind of yeah. information because you can't learn that from fossils uh but Not still, nearly as much yeah. and it's a great perspective to have to be able to work up close with living creatures yeah and so trying to bring the that that fossil mindset into an aquarium or zoo setting uh is kind of what my my goal has been recently that's really and you you, you're doing paleo tours now i've designed which is really cool so you've snuck it in it's you know it's fine and it's one of those (laughs) things where like we had some fossils that were in the education department that had been donated in that they did for like you know bring it out show the kid and let them touch it we have a megalodon jaw that's up in one of the hallways Um, but they basically had a whole bunch of fossils that they didn't have anything to do with. And so, uh, I made a fossil dig activity, uh, spearheaded when they'd had fossil day, they've done stuff with a local club and I tried to increase what they did there. So just trying to bring those things in because, and that's what the whole point of the tour is, is sort of was saying about studying modern animals is when you or I go through a zoo or an aquarium, we see the snake and the alligator and the panda and the zebra well, we also see their history you know yeah. when we're thinking about them we're not just going oh that's a cool animal we're going oh and you know what else is cool this guy's ancestors this guy's relatives yeah there's a whole nother deeper layers of that animal that you don't see if you don't study fossils and trying to share that aspect of these guys are cool what was also cool was what these guys used to be, what they were related yes. to. That's a really cool way to, to perceive it. And that's what, you know, that, that the whole point of the outreach and the, the communication is to show people why this stuff is interesting yeah. and, and show people what we're learning. These days it happens, and I've been, I've been getting there, uh, it happens a lot online. It happens a lot in social media. Yeah. Uh, Twitter, dear listeners, if you are, are interested in you know, being up to date with cool paleo stuff or any science, really, hop on Twitter. Uh, scientists are all over the place. Uh, we will have a Twitter yes. for this podcast as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, scientists talking to the public. Museum displays are a huge, huge, huge part of, of science education. Um, and that's how, and this, I think, is it, you know, brings up earlier we were talking about what, you know, why, why is paleontology important? And we talked about all those cool applications and how it's neat, but I think the other sort of the final piece of that answer is paleontology introduces people to science. Yeah. Um, most, you know, maybe not most, but a lot of scientists, I was going to say most kids, but I yeah. reframed it. A lot of scientists got their start looking at dinosaur bones yeah, absolutely. in a museum when they were five. You know, it, it's a really great introduction to scientific concepts. Yeah, because everyone loves dinosaurs. Like everybody loves dinosaurs. I think that paleontology and astronomy, yeah, are probably the two biggest. You know, getting kids hooked. Science, which incidentally are also uh, the two that I would say have the most misunderstandings yeah. and confusions around them. Yeah, uh, which is interesting. I was thinking about that earlier because. Uh, Astronomy is also one of those uh, 
you're typically looking at things that are an unbelievable distance away and therefore also ridiculously old. Like, oh yeah. Things that have already happened and were nowhere near us. And that's, it's, it's the other science that typically is dealing with scales that the human mind can't really wrap. Like oh, yeah. our brain is not built to actually understand a million. So when we no. say 400 million years or, you know, 6 million light years away, like, we know mathematically what you mean, but our brain can't actually picture that. Yeah, it's a number. It's a we number. We should do... We'll have to do an episode about geologic time yeah. and, and sort of laying out... There's a whole bunch of really cool uh, websites where you can... There's I think the Field Museum has an interactive geologic time scale. Oh, nice. There's a lot of cool stuff. See, I, I always think back to when I was a kid, I had a book called How Big is a Million? Uh, That's cool. And it's... If I can find it... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll show because it, it was really fantastic and it's what always cemented that idea in my mind ever since I was little was and the, basically the book just kept building up and it would show you different examples like it'd be like you know let's okay let's use gallons and they would say mm -hmm. 10 gallons is this much a Olympic sized swimming pool is this many gallons if you wanted a hundred thousand gallons you would need this much sp and they would just keep working right, up and right. then they said if you needed a million gallons, and then they would show you how much. And uh, yeah. my favorite part of it was one where, and it was this, it was a weird little kid's book. It was a wizard get, with a whole bunch of kids, and he was explaining to them what uh, a million was. Don't know who he is. I don't know if he's in other books. <laughs> he was never <laughs> introduced. Just, just a guy. He, he was just the million wizard. Uh, the book taught kids to trust wizards. Yeah. No, wizards are our friend. Um, Always. And there's a, he's in a hot air balloon, and they're looking at the stars. And the next, like, five pages of the book are just covered in stars. And it says there are, I think it was like 100,000 stars on the next five pages. That's pretty cool. And it said if we had a million stars on these pages, and they showed how long the page would be. As right, it, right, and the right. whole point was showing you that a million is so much bigger. No matter how big you think it is, it's bigger than that. <laughs> Yeah. It is bigger that's, than you imagine it to be. That's really cool. And it was it's, yeah. It was great. It's a it's it's and then that you know that kind of thing is the job of educators. Mm -hmm. Getting the ideas across. Um and I, I we should mention that it's not just scientists giving talks or giving tours or writing news articles. Um science outreach happens in uh you know, the, the other, I guess, the big one, and this is one that, that's really not unique to paleontology, but, but has a special place in it, is art. Yeah. Because artwork, paleontology doesn't exist in the public eye without art. Yes. If no one had ever seen a reconstruction of what T-Rex may have looked like, I'd, you know, it, it's hard to see how it would be as popular as yeah. it is today if all people were looking at his bones. Yeah. Like, the skeletons are cool-looking. Yeah. But what everyone wants is a drawing of it yeah. doing something, of it being an animal. What did it look like? And as long as, as fossils have been being dug up, there have been artistic yeah. reconstructions. And, and earlier on, they, they made the statues and the sculptures yep. as with the first, first major fossils that were ever found. Yep. And, the, you know, movies do this. Um, although that's not usually very educational. Yeah. Uh, documentaries do it. So, you know, that outreach is something that uh, the scientists themselves and then sci people who are more focused on communication like we are, uh, are, it's, you know, it's, it's a, and then the artists and it, you know, a, a wide, wide group of people coming together to, to present these ideas to the public, yeah. which is really important. So no, that's cool. And that is paleontology. Yeah. No, that, that um, about we, wraps up the general concept. There we go. Podcast over. Boom. That's it. The whole series. Yeah. We did it. There. Next done. next time we talk about space. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to cover a science every time. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, we, uh, for the benefit of the listeners, we skipped over uh, a bajillion things. Yeah. There's so much more detail and, and we'll explore a lot of it in future episodes so, 
Yeah, I yeah. think I think we have reached the end of, of episode one. I think so. We should mention that uh, we will have, you know, you can, we, we're going to be all over internet type stuff, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Yep. But particularly, uh, our blog on WordPress, Common Descent Podcast on WordPress, we will post um, some follow-up ideas yeah. uh, to, to sort of build off of some of the things we talked about on here. So yeah. Cool. Anything else? Did we miss anything? Is there No, I think I think we covered pretty well. Uh, uh hope uh, hope you guys enjoyed our our first foray into podcasting. Absolutely. We will do it again. Yes. Uh we'll be back. We are going to post fortnightly. Yes. As, That's the official as it plan. Is, uh the correct way to call it. As the kids say, <laughs> fortnightly. Uh <laughs> Fortnightly makes me think of an like a a place. Yeah, Fortnite. Like it sounds like it's the name of a place. Yes, Fortnite. it does. It does. Uh, Fortnitely is every other week. We could call it bi-monthly, but that's not as cool. No. And we we only and we, we only call use it, cool terminology. Uh, bi-weekly, if we wanted to be confusing. We, yes, we are going to post bi-weekly, which means one of two things, <laughs> uh, and you'll know when you yeah look for us and we're not there. So just check continuously. Check every <laughs> three days. <laughs> All right. Well, we should wrap it up here. Uh, like Will said, thank you very much for listening. We hope you will join us again on Absolutely. the next podcast. And that's it. Now we're going to ramble and trail off into the outro music. All right, guys. So <laughs> see you next right. time. And that's a wrap. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time. Music